We are in our second part today of our five sermon series on our core values. Um, I don't know how long ago that the church decided that they had a mission statement, and then they, later on they came back and they reworked their mission statement. But um, we wanted to take what the five core values in the mission statement and get it off of a piece of paper that is stuck on a wall in my office or it's in our, at the beginning of our Constitution and bylaws. We want to actually see what it means. If this is something that we say that we as a church believe, then let's do it. Amen? Let's not just do Bible study. Let's do Bible doing. Let's not just hear about what the Bible says. Let's make up our mind that we're going to go out and do what the Bible says. And these are our five core values. And by the way, don't think for an instance that I'm trying to say that shaking hands is wrong. But we started doing the high fives, right? We started to do the high five because we have high core values. Now, I said a while back, and it's amazing the things that some people remember. I said, if you don't give a high five, it'll cost you $5 in the offering plate. Bradley says he's $500 behind. Where's Ricky Davis? He's $500 behind, treasurer. Collect from him. But trust me, I'm not trying to get I, I'm fine with shaking hands, amen? But this is what our five core values are. The first one begins with we are to love God. Amen? The great commandment. Love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. One finger pointed up with God. All right? The second finger, oh, by the way, one represents worship. All right? The second finger, y'all remember from the 70s, this was peace. We have peace with God. We have peace with each other. The great commandment is to love God, but also we're supposed to love others as much as we love ourselves. So two together. Three is evangelism. Remember the three crosses. Jesus was in the center, dying to save the world from its sins. And on each side of Jesus, one sinner received <clears throat> forgiveness that day. One sinner chose to reject forgiveness that day. So three is the third finger represents evangelism. Four, think about the four parts of your heart. And we want to give our heart over to God. That's discipleship. We want to be discipled in every aspect of our life. So we worship, we fellowship, we do evangelism, we do discipleship. And the fifth thing, actually, take your full hand, serve someone, we do service. Matter of fact, if you see someone doing service, give them a thumbs up. That's what the thumb represents. So when we think of our high five, now I understand it's very easy to forget things. Lord knows I do. That's why we're doing the high five, is to help remind you what our core value is here at New Holland as Christians serving the Lord and seeing how we could do those things together. And today, we're going to talk about number two. We're going to talk about fellowship. If you have your Bible, look over into Acts chapter 2. This is the scripture that those before us, when they pulled our mission statement together, this is the scripture that they used. And it's the scripture that talks about Pentecost in verse 40. It says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Be saved. So that's salvation extended. Then in verse 41, then those who gladly received this word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. That salvation received. It was extended. It was received. And today we're going to talk about salvation lived. So if you would stand with me in honor of reading God's word. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sowed their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's pray. Father, it is an honor to call you my Father, the God of the universe. Lord John 15 says, not only Father, but friend. 
Thank you, Jesus, for loving me when there was nothing loving about me. Thank you for coming and making a way so that I could know you, that I could be forgiven by you, and I could be part of your family. And Father, I want to do what you would have me to do, and I want to uh, act the way you would want me to act. And Father, I believe in these five core values. that they, they are straight from your word. And Father, I thank you for New Holland. And I thank you for how we've come together to, uh, to seek to honor you and worship you. And Lord, to love you with all of our heart, but teach us what it truly means to love each other as well. Father, open our eyes to see what fellowship is. But Lord, hear this prayer. Not so that we could just learn more about fellowship, but Lord, we could do fellowship for your honor and glory and for our benefit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. So salvation was extended, salvation was received, then they had to walk it out every day. Salvation lived. Look in verse 42 again. It said, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Steadfastly. It means to adhere, to be devoted, to be constantly together, to continue all the time, to persevere when it gets difficult and not to faint, but to, to continue on, to, to stay constant and ready. When circumstances are not easy, keep going. When you feel like it, do it. When you don't feel like it, Stay at it. There are some things that are very easy for us to do and some things that we really need to work on. Some things that, that though it may not come easy, does not mean that it's not important. It says that they con continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Do you need, believe that we need some discipleship? Oh, that was an amen moment. You believe we need discipleship to be more like God, to do the things that God would have us to do? I agree with that, and I think if we voted on that to get together, we would all say that we need to grow up and to be all that Christ wanted us to be. But he also puts on equal, an equal plane there, a, a discipleship and fellowship. Now, we would say we need to grow towards Christ, which means we need to learn more and we need to do more. But do we really think that we need to fellowship? You know, we look at it and we say, well, fellowship's easy. Sometimes it is. And to that I say amen. But sometimes it needs to be intentional. So we need to continue on. We need to make sure that we're all going to say, I want to, to be together with others. I want to live life together. That's what the title to the sermon is. Laura always wants me to give a title to the sermon. I had to think about it. I said, that's what the church should be. We're, the church is not the building. We're God's people. And we want to live the gospel together. We want to live the good news. We want to live Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, Proverbs 27 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. I believe I need you to help me in discipleship. But I will also say, I need you to help me in my fellowship. I want to have fellowship with God. I want to worship Him. I want everything in life, we talked about this, I want everything in life to come from my heart that's overflowing in love for Him. We can make everything worship if we do it with the right intent of our heart. But let's do it together. As iron sharpens iron. I may sharpen you, you may sharpen me. We do life together. We do church together, not just from 11 to 12 on Sunday, but all the time. We need to encourage each other. We need to strengthen each other. We need to fellowship together. It says here that they, uh, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread. They ate together. And it says that and in prayers, they prayed together. It's good that you pray. I'm not saying don't, not, don't do that. <coughs> I'm saying don't stop there. 
We need to worship together. Amen. We need to be in small groups in Sunday school together and be discipled together. Amen. We need to, to pray together. We need to give together. We need to do service together. We need to fellowship together. Let's do it all together. And it says here in the end of verse 44, now they who believed were together. They did everything together. They're Pentecost, the, the gospel came. People were saved. People were baptized. The church was born. But look what it says there. And, and they had all things in common. Now, not personality-wise, but there's a new life coming on here. So now they're seeking to do it together, and they called it fellowship. Those of you may even know the, the Greek word for that. We don't have to know the Greek word for everything, but this word is koinonia. And it means to have association. It means community. It means joint participation. That's huge. We'll talk more about that. It means to share which one has together. If me and Andy and Rick bought a sailboat together, we would say we were joint owners in it. But that would be no fun. Amen? We'd have to pay for it together, and I'm grateful that I only had to pay one-third, bless God. But the cool part would be when Andy and Rick and I would get together and we would sail together. You know what sailboats are for? Doing it together. Joint participation. Now, we can define what the church is, but truly what the church should do is come together and do it together. Do the fun part of life together. Do the joy of the Lord together. Let's not just talk about salvation. Let's live our salvation together. I know all the time I'm asking and pleading for an amen, but every now and again, it's all right if you could amen together. Amen. Some people say, you know, I enjoy doing things together. Some people say, no, I'm, that's just not who I am. You know, some people are extroverted. Some people are introverted. And some people are a combination of the two. I'm kind of a combo. I mean, I can be up here, and it really doesn't matter how many people I'm in front of. I'm very comfortable. I'm very extroverted. But my wife will tell you, also, I am very introverted. And I, I can get alone, and I'm, I'm just fine with just me, you know. But people will sometimes use that as an excuse because they like to isolate, and they don't like to be around other people. And they say, well, that's just not my personality. Listen. Please hear this. There's no right personality or wrong personality. It's the personality God gave you. Are y'all good with that? And if God gave it to you, you're not wrong for living that personality. If God made you an extrovert, amen, be extroverted. If God made you, made you an introvert, okay, don't feel inferior because of that. If he puts you some combo in there, that's fine. But that does not excuse you. It does not give you a pass to where this part of the commandments of God you don't have to do. I don't care if it's easy for you or you have to push yourself into places that you may be a little uncomfortable sometime. You still need to do life together with others. John Donay said, no man is an island unto himself. Well, that is true. We all need fellowship together. The secret is bring who you are to the table. Bring your gifts, bring your talents, bring your love, bring your personality, bring your heartaches, bring your hurts, bring your hang-ups, bring your junk, bring your jewelry, bring who you are, and we'll do it together. We don't need just a few of the good to go along with the rest of us bad. Let's just bring it all together, lump it up, let God mix it up, let it put it into the, the oven of his grace, and we'll grow up in Christ. It's not one or another. It's not we need this or that. I'm here to tell you we need a whole lot of all of it. And if we're not careful, 
will see fellowship through your eyes rather than seeing fellowship through God's eyes. Koinonia, harmony, togetherness, having understanding. When someone in the family is hurting, you hurt, having sympathy, having empathy for them, feeling their pain understanding of them solidarity together the Bible uses this term the body of Christ as a matter of fact in Romans 12 verse 5 it says so we all of us being many are one body in Christ and individually members get this now of one another we're one body but we're one body in Christ, and you bring who you are to the table. That's good, because you bring your part to it, and all of us together become something different or special. 1 Corinthians 12 says this, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being member, many, are one body, so also is Christ. So truly, we're not going to get the pure image of Christ unless you can see all of us. I'm not the image. I may be the big mouth. Amen? That would have been another amen moment for you. But you know, we need two ears. Because if you don't have two ears, one ear can't do it all. It may hear one thing well, but it doesn't hear the other quite as well. We need two eyes. You can see out of one, but when you put the two together, they work together and they give you depth perception. And it's so much better to have two than one. God designed it that way. Amen? So we take everything that the God, God gives together. These fingers are great, and these fingers may be as far away from them as possible, but they work together. Sometimes I wonder what that little pinky's for, or maybe that little toe. You forget about until you're walking through the house in the middle of the night and you hit the dresser. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Then it says, I'm here. Right? My mom had one toe when she was a child. She jumped across a gully, and when she did, uh, she hit a piece of glass, and it cut that toe off. And my mom, for the rest of her life, the, the, the things that I take for granted of all toes working together, she did not have. And there are things in our body that we don't realize how much we need it until it's hurting or defected or down, and then the rest of the body feels the pain. I want for New Holland Baptist Church to not have a few healthy people. I want a church full of healthy people. Because when one in the church hurts, we all hurt. And when some are receiving the blessings of God's grace and the love of God is overflowing, then isn't it wonderful that, that God, what God gave them can overflow and, overflow and bless the ones who may need a little bit? We all are together. That is not my design. That's God's design, and it is good. But Satan has a design, too. John 10, 10 says he came to steal, to, to kill, and to destroy. He's got a design. God's design is that we come together in Christ. God's design is that we have fellowship together. God's design is that we are strong together. Satan's de design is to divide and conquer. So somebody gets hurt and they move over to the side and to the fringe where Satan can pick them off. How many times have you heard me say this, church? If you hang out with me long, you're going to hear it many more times. Satan always attacks relationships. Always comes to divide relationships. To bring a division. So just understand that. There may be nothing that you can do about that other person, 
But you need to make sure you can do what you're supposed to on your side of that person. Satan seeks to attack the body of Christ like cancer will attack an organ in your body. How many of you know it may find its place in one place, but it's not satisfied there? It wants to grow and attack that organ next to it. And once it's there, it wants to set in and conquer the whole. And just like cancer will attack you, he'll attack one in our body. We don't want sickness in one part of our body. We don't want sickness in any part of our body. And it is the joy, it is the supreme joy of, of the body of Christ when one is hurting or down or depleted or faint to go and to enrich and encourage and strengthen and nurture. That's fellowship. That's body life. And it is neglected because we only see our life as this between us and God. But when you look at the cross, make sure you see it this way and this way. We need to be right with God. But you can't be right with God if you're wrong with someone else. Let me talk a little bit more about Satan's design. Alienation. Disgruntlement. Coldness. Distance. An estrangement in relationships. Bitterness. Animosity. It can even move to the place of hostility and rancor and spite. I mean, you could sum it up by just saying a whole lot of antagonism. God never meant it that way. God doesn't want it to be that way. Let me give you an example. Someone does something that you don't like or that you don't approve of. It may even be very hurtful to you. So what happens? We step away. If somebody does something to you that's hurtful, you'll just remove your love from that. Well, that's how you feel. You'll remove your approval. Distance will be created. A coldness will replace harmony. Church, look up here at me. That's the home I grew up in. If I did something, and my dad was a godly man, but he was a product of how he grew up as well, and I understand that. We're all flawed. But if I did something that they did not approve of, instead of coming and talking to me about it and having a Matthew 18 moment, he would just remove his love from me not talk, not have fellowship. And really, it was about, I was supposed to go beg and tell them, I'm sorry, I don't know what I did, but I'm sorry. We can be very controlling like that, can't we? And it doesn't mean that there's not hurt. But if, if we're not careful, what we'll do if, if somebody does something that you don't like or you don't approve of or it may be very hurtful to you, the first thing that we often do is we remove our love from it. When the very opposite is what God wanted us to do. Instead of removing love, God wants us to move in with love. When we remove our love, Satan is pleased and God is grieved. People say, well, you just don't know how bad it hurt. They, they hurt me. Why would they do that? Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That means if somebody hurts me, I'm not to remove my love for them. I'm supposed to go back to God, worship God, find the rest and the peace and the love that God can give and let it overflow on me to where I can take that love that I am so grateful for that God loves me the way that he does and he gives me mercy and, and he's done so much for me that I can go back to that person who has removed their love from me and I can just pour my, more love on them. The Bible actually talks about it in certain places called letting it pouring 
fire on their head. You mean I can make them miserable by loving on them? Try it sometimes. If you can't do it for the right thing, do it for the spot thing. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. We'll remove that one out of the video too. All I'm telling you is that, that our peace and our love comes from God, not from circumstances. Luke 17, 1 says this, it is an impossible, it is impossible, it is impossible that no offenses may come. But woe to that one through whom the offenses do come. There's going to be offenses, there's going to be difficulty, there's going to be hardship. But I don't want to be the one that makes it worse. I want to be on the loving side and I'll let God work on the other side because God's the only one who can make anything good there anyway. Don't let what someone else has done affect your righteousness. Let me give you another example. Someone's going through a very difficult time and they're hurt. And by the way, hurt people will hurt other people. Y'all agree with that? So they're mean and they're hurtful to others. And they may not even realize that they're being mean and hurtful and, because there's just something going on in them. Listen to me now. They don't need your condemnation. They don't need you to remove your love. They need patience. In the Bible, it talks about this term, long-suffering. Matter of fact, isn't that one of the fruits of the Spirit? It means to suffer long. It means to suffer and suffer a little bit more and suffer a little bit more until God makes it right. They need help. They need forgiveness. They need blessings. We need fellowship that springs from the love of Christ. God's love. When God defines his love, the word agape means to cherish. It's hard to cherish something. <laughs> it's extremely hard to cherish something that's trying to bite you. Y'all seen them little bitty dogs? About the size of a tennis ball. And they look so cute. You want to reach down there to pet it, and it'll bite you. I don't want to hit it like a tennis ball, amen? <laughs> bite me. You know, there are people in life that you may look at them and say, I don't see any value in that person at all. Hold on. If we're going to have the love of God, we're going to look at them not through our eyes and our thoughts. We're going to see them the way God sees them. Does God love them? Does God forgive them? Does God want his best for them? Oh, it's getting quiet in here. It means to cherish. It means to support. God's love, I cherish it and I will support it. Aren't you grateful that God loves us? He cherishes us, supports us, encourages us. It means to give of yourself for another. It actually means to see value there and to see that if you can take of the overabundance in you and purchase blessing on their behalf. Is that not what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary? The one who had everything, who lacked nothing, who left all of that in heaven behind, who came down here and allowed us to treat him awful. And I know they whipped him and they beat him and they cursed him and they spit on him and they pulled out his beard. But listen to me, we've done pretty much the same thing in how we've treated God. When he's done so much for us, and it's like a spoiled child, we want to receive all that, but we better, they better do nice by me, or if they don't, I'll just remove my love from them. That's not fellowship. That's the ultimate in selfishness. And there's a little awkward feel to the room because I think the Holy Spirit's hitting our hearts because I can tell you we all do it. It's extremely natural for us. And there's a cheering section behind us that's cheering us to go out and throw more stones. Like the woman caught in adultery. Don't you think she was embarrassed? Don't you think her heart was breaking within her? And they came to accuse her. And she was guilty. But they came with rocks in their hands ready to, to stone her. And Jesus said, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. He didn't strike back. 
He gave love and sympathy and empathy and wanted a cord. Go and sin no more. He wanted a cord, fellowship, union. I wonder the next time Jesus saw her. Don't you know he smiled at her? Don't you know when she felt like being condemned, how wonderful it made her feel to receive the opposite? Fellowship, church. Fellowship together. God's love. This is what Jesus died for. The Shema says to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen? That's worship. And one day when I get to heaven, all this junk that's holding me back is going to be taken away so I can celebrate God and how I truly feel on the inside is going to come out. What a day that will be. But there's another thing about heaven. It's just not going to be me and God there. Red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight and they're going to be there. And they may not look like me. They may not have the same background that I have. But you know, there's somebody that God loves completely just like he loves me. And, and, and folks, it's a haven of rest. And lo everybody loves everybody perfectly. Amen? <laughs> that was weak. When you see that person, you're going to say, my brother, my sister. Amen? No division. Everyone accepts everyone. Everyone values everyone. We are equal in Christ. No cliques in heaven. There's not going to be a bad dissection and a Church of God section and a Church of Christ section and the Presbyterian section. You know, one section's cold, one section's hot. One section's crowded. One section you can't understand anything they're saying over there. Folks, it's just going to be Christ's people filled, listen to me now, loved and controlled by the same Spirit that I have when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. We're going to celebrate our uniqueness, not divisions. Perfect friendships. Ken, I see you sitting back there. I can tell you one thing. We're way too wide of a church. I love you, brother. I thank you for coming. Don't you think the church should look like the community? Now, New Holland, I know you. And I know that you're a loving church. And you're, you're saying, I don't care who they are. They're welcome here. Would you all agree with that? We know that. I'm not sure that they know that. So we're going to have to let that same fellowship that we have in there go with us when we leave this place. It's good that we've got fellowship inside here. But we need to make sure that we have the love of Christ and fellowship out there. I don't care if they got $5 billion or $0.05 cents, or they owe $5 billion. They need to be in church too, amen? We'll give them financial freedom. We'll teach them some things about it. I don't care if they I don't care if they've been on in Reedsville or a rehab. I don't care. Y'all know my background. I've worked with people since 1994 that have problems with addiction. I don't look down on anybody. You know why? Because <laughs> God's done a work of grace in me. Fellowship. Some people like city churches. Some people like country churches. Some people like tall preachers. And some people like skinny preachers. I don't like skinny preachers. <laughs> Amen. Some preachers can sing, Brother Mark, and then there's me. Right? There's not an approval group and a non-approval group. And we say that, now it's our opportunity to live that. You know why I think we have these things up front? 
Because when we get to heaven, that's the way it's going to be. Aren't we supposed to get ready for heaven now? So, perfect friendships, no animosity, only unity, no estrangement. When we get to heaven, there'll be no need for forgiveness. Where there's plenty of need for forgiveness now, so let's just make it sure that forgiveness is freely given. One body, united in Christ, celebrating our diversity, and I believe strengthened by our uniqueness. What are we going to do with fellowship? We can talk about it, or we can do it. There are some things that are very easy for us to do. There are some things that are a little bit more difficult. I will tell you that fellowship, koinonia, togetherness, oneness, being united, is something that if you do not work on, if you do not have it constantly in your thoughts, it will stray. We will become fractured. Y'all ever heard of Humpty Dumpty? I got a word for you. He was pushed. <laughs> and all the king's horses and all the king's men may not be able to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but I am a perfect testimony of Christ can. He's the only one who can. So we come and we invite broken people. No perfect people allowed inside. Just those that are forgiven. Those that are grateful. We're not going to look down our nose. We're going to reach out our hand. No clicks. No, listen, it hurts when we live in this world of brokenness and animosity. I understand that. But this is the oasis. This is where people can come and feel rest and love. Let us be about the Lord's business with all of our heart. So mind and strength. And by the way, we're supposed to love each other the way we want to be loved. It does not say do unto others as they did unto you. But do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We've got a higher calling, church. And if you do not know Jesus Christ, what I'm speaking to you sounds like Latin. How could I ever love someone like that? Look, if you don't have the love of God in your heart, you can't. But the same God that forgave me will forgive you. What a mighty God we serve. All you have to do is repent of your sins. Turn your back on that. I don't want to live that way anymore. Lord, I confess I have done wrong. Would you forgive me? Lord, I invite you to come into my heart. My life I give to you. I want your healing. I want your forgiveness. I want your salvation. And if you mean it from your heart to God's heart, He'll hear your prayer. You don't have to earn it. Just receive it. Believe. He'll do it for you. Let's pray. Father God, here we are, your people. Lord, we stand in need. We have been hurt, and we have hurt others. Father, I have done the same things that I did not want anyone to ever do to me. Father, forgive me for that. Lord, I know that we need fellowship, but Lord, I know that I must be about helping create fellowship, a bonding together. Lord, it's, it's, we need more than just people saying, yeah, that'd be a good thing. We need people who are ready to engage it. Father, we're stronger together. We're the body of Christ. We need the talents of everyone. We are deplete if we don't have it. Lord, may everyone yield their heart unto you. Father, in a moment as we give this invitation, I pray that in that moment, people will deal with their heart to you. Lord, if there's someone here that does not know you as Savior, may they trust you today. May they pray and invite you to forgive them and come into their heart and save them. Bless their repentance, O oh God. Hear their prayer. 
Lord, if there's someone that needs to join this church, if there's someone who needs to be baptized, if there's someone who needs to go get right with someone, whatever it is, Lord, let it begin today. Let it begin right now. This invitation, Lord, I give to you. Holy Spirit, you give it as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.